Thank you everybody for joining us here today in welcoming Maria Dentino to present her book, The Light Above. Maria Dentino has worked in higher education for 30 years, the first 23 at Keene State College in Keene, New Hampshire, as an educational counselor and instructor of first year writing in the past six years in the library at Flagler College in St. Augustine, Florida. Maria is the co-founder and writer for the Nasty Women Writers Project, where she and her sister, Teresa, highlight women whose voices have been sidelined and erased from the fabric of our collective experience. Nasty Women Writers resists this shutdown on powerful women voices and claims nasty as a stance of power, not the put down of the intended. Visit their website at nastywomenswriters.com. Currently, Maria lives in St. Augustine, Florida, and yet makes trips north whenever possible to visit family, friends, and especially her grandson, Jackson. Yes, <laughs> thank you very much. Well, I do want to start off by thanking Elise and the Toadstool Bookshop. I really appreciate this opportunity to share my work. It really means a lot. Um, and we all know how important hometown and local bookstores are. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's really um, an incredible um, addition to our communities. We obviously all love books and, and we strive to support our local bookstores, which is so important. You know, I grew up in Keene, like a lot of you I see on the screen did, and I remember going to Toadstool all the time. Um, and I remember it when it was in the Colony Mill, uh, going around and picking out a book and then going, going to the food court and getting a good cup of coffee and reading for a while. So I have such fond memories of Toadstool and current ones too. I love your local, um, your recent um, current location on Emerald Street is a beautiful um, spot as well. So thank you to Toadstool for years and years of um, community service, so to speak. Okay, so thank you all for being here today. Um, it means a lot to um, see all of you. I am so thrilled by it. And hi, Lara. <laughs> um, so again, I'm Maria, and I am on what I call my first book journey. And it is quite a ride. I'm enjoying it a lot. Um, but I'd be nowhere without all of you. And I mean that, every one of you here today and everyone along the way who has played a support role and the support role, who has been supportive and um, in all kinds of ways, really means a lot. My book, The Light Above, a memoir with Margaret Fuller, is considered creative nonfiction. Um, and so what I'd like to do is I'm going to start with, and it's a memoir, of course, um, but I'm going to start with a PowerPoint um, because I'd like to spend a little bit of time um, putting Margaret Fuller in context. She is why I wrote the book. Um, and I know some of you probably know more about her um, than others. Some of you may not have ever heard of her until you got a hold of my book. Um, but I, I do, I'm going to share a PowerPoint for the first few minutes. And I'm going to shut my camera off while I do that. Okay, here. Bear with me. Okay, so I want to start off with my book cover. <laughs> um, many of you know, but some of you may not know that my son, Keegan Monahan, who I know is here with us this morning, um, did the oil painting that is the cover of, of my book. And his partner, partner, Jenna Sia Curry, who is also here this morning, she designed the text on the cover. And that makes my book even more special. <laughs> and I have to thank my publisher, Shanti Arts, for their willingness. They were wide open to my suggestions and they um, happily worked with um, what we came up with. So I really appreciate that. So who was this Margaret Fuller? That was a question that Margaret asked herself often. And she usually had an answer for that question. Um, and why did Maria Dentino, why did I write a book about her? Um, okay, so Margaret, Sarah Margaret Fuller was born in 1810 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
this is a picture of her, the house she was born in and lived her first years in, as it stands today. It's in Cambridge on Cherry Street. And since early last century, it has been the Margaret Fuller Neighborhood House um, since 1902. And Margaret would be so thrilled, or is thrilled, I'm sure, um, with the use of her, her home. Um, she, I mean, because the services they provide um, are incredible to the community and also they do a lot of literacy work, um, especially work with a lot of um, new immigrants. And Margaret Fuller was a huge proponent of education. Um, she knew that education was power. Um, she was a living example of it. Um, and she, uh, you know, she really, in particular, really fought for education for girls and women at the time. Oh, and she was born Sarah Margaret Fuller. Early on, she dropped. She didn't fully drop the Sarah, but she decided early on that she would that she wanted to be called Margaret. And it was a little bit of a fuss about that because that's her mother's name. So there was some like, well, why do you want to be called Margaret? We already have a Margaret. But um, she was pretty firm about it. Um, and so she became known as, as Margaret Fuller, as opposed to Sarah. In her professional and creative life, uh, Margaret Fuller was many, many things. She was an author. She was an editor. She was an educator, a journalist, a translator, a literary critic, a transcendentalist, a part of the transcendental movement, um, a woman's right advocate, a social reformer, and more. And by more, I mean she was an incredible orator, uh, speaker, and she was a poet. And this is just her professional and creative life. She had a very vibrant personal life tons of friends. She was a really good friend to, to people and, um, and family member. She really took care of um, her family. Margaret inspired and empowered others through her groundbreaking writings, especially her Woman in the 19th Century, which uh, was published in 1845. It's considered the first feminist book written in this country by um, in a, a person from America, from the United States. Um, and for years, Margaret led conversations for women designed to empower women to read, think, and discuss important issues of the day. Um, and, and these courses were called conversations and they were held at Elizabeth Peabody's house in Boston, which at the time was also an international bookstore. Um, it is now a Mexican restaurant if you ever want to go. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the whole idea behind the conversations was to allow women an opportunity to um, go beyond um, the bounds, which was then the woman's sphere, which was the private, private and domestic realm of life. And women really weren't allowed or encouraged to step out of that. These conversations led women into the more public sphere and help to give them the um, confidence and the, you know, just the opportunity to go beyond the, the kinds of um, uh, subjects and um, things that they were allowed to do in their very limited education at that time. They were very powerful, very well attended. A matter of fact, Elizabeth Cady Stanton attended. I mean, I could go on with the, with the woman in the Boston area. Who, who attended her conversations that um, they lasted um, for five years. You know, she offered um, these courses for five years. The books and writings by Margaret Fuller, she wrote Summer on the Lakes in 1843. This is a, like a tra travelogue, but it's full of social commentary and it's very artistic as well, very literary, uh, very good read. It was very popular at the time. Um, and that was the book that allowed her to be the first woman to go into the Harvard Library. They actually allowed her to go in she couldn't attend Harvard, um, but she could go into the library and do her research, and she was the first woman allowed to do so. Woman in the 19th Century, again by S. Margaret Fuller, um, came out in 1845. As I said, it was groundbreaking, really sparked the first wave of feminism in this country. It's a really good read. And Papers on Literature and Art um, was a collection of her essays. She wrote a lot of essays, and this particular collection is very powerful because she was helping to really um, 
you know, she had a vision for where American literature, poetry, and art should go. She really felt like America needed the United States at that time, really being a pretty young country, really needed their own identity. Um, in, and uh, uh, Walt Whitman, um, one of the essays in this book calling for um, an American poet. And, and anyhow, he ripped the essay from the book and kept it with him forever. And I, I believe that he, he fulfilled um, what she envisioned. Fuller also wrote a lot of essays, like I said, poetry. She wrote columns. She became a journalist and her columns were about culture, politics, art, literature, travel. Um, she wrote a lot of literary criticism. She was very good at it and she set a lot of the standards. She wrote book reviews. A lot of people feel that she was the first person in this country to do book reviews. Um, she wrote obviously tons of letters and journals and et cetera. The Dial magazine, which was around for a long time, but it was the first real avant-garde literary journal in this country. She was the first editor of that. She actually probably would have continued, but she didn't get paid. Um, and so that made it difficult. <laughs> um, and she was um, a columnist, a journalist for Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. Um, her columns were widely read. There was a large readership and she, um, Horace really knew how kind of um, kind of popular she was. Like people really knew who she was, and they liked what she had to say, and they trusted her. Um, she was someone who really did speak the truth. Didn't always go over well, but she did it. And he would put her columns in places that were um, highly, you know, that were places that he knew his readers would would see it and go to it. So he um, she uh, was the first female journalist for his paper, the first female foreign correspondent and the first female war correspondent. Um, Charles A. Madison and his Critics and Crusaders. And what I've done here is I've pulled a few quotes that I feel like really helped to sum up who she was and why it's very tragic that she basically got erased. Um, but Charles A. Madison and the Critics and Crusaders said, her in great intellectual vigor, because she was this, the most intellectual woman in this country at the time, and many say in Europe as well, but her great intellectual vigor, her extraordinary generosity of spirit, and above all, her passionate criticism of the parochialism and materialism about her made her the effective leader of those who resented the restraints of their Calvinistic environment and sought to enthrone the precious freedoms of civilized man. It is this champion, 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 that's a hard word. It is this championing, <laughs> okay, sorry about that, of human rights, this abhorrence of oppression and inequality of any kind that still endears her name to all lovers of liberty and democracy. Vernon L. Harrington, Harrington, in his Main Currents in American Thought, had this to say about Margaret. Misunderstood in her own time, caricatured by unfriendly critics, and with significant facts of her life suppressed by her friends, by a chivalrous sense of loyalty, the real woman has been lost in a Margaret Fuller myth, and later generations have come to underestimate her powers and undervalue her work. Yet no other woman of her generation in America is so well worth recalling. Henry James years later, not too many years later, but some years later, Henry James, the writer, he talked a lot about the Margaret Fuller ghost, that she was no longer, that people didn't understand her and that um, she had become a ghost of sorts. Why don't more of us know about Margaret Fuller? And today we might describe Margaret Fuller's being lesser known than her contemporaries as Erasure. Um, Pearl Fagel, literary critic formerly with the N NPR in the New York Time Times Book Review, defines Erasure. Erasure refers to the practice of collective indifference that renders certain people and groups invisible. The word migrated out of the academy where it alluded to the tendency of ideologies to dismiss inconvenient facts and is increasingly used 
to describe how inconvenient people are dismissed, are dismissed, their history, pain, and achievements blotted out. Margaret Fuller was systematically erased. Um, Joseph J. Days in his book, The Roman Years of Margaret Fuller has this to say, it seems strange that such 19th century middling names, such as Julia Ward Howe, Louisa May Alcott, Susan B. Anthony, are commonly remembered in the United States, while Margaret Fuller is not. Today, she is only known to an intellectual elite. Well, first off, I do wanna say that I think that Julia Ward Howe, Louise May Alcott, and Susan B. Anthony, I wouldn't consider them middling, <laughs> um, but I do think he is right in that Margaret belongs um, there for certain. She should be remembered um, for who she was and what she contributed and what she had to say, what it, what, how it's relevant today. And, you know, she is known to an intellectual elite or a scholarly circle. There are a lot of really good biographies about her. Um, the most recent one by Meg Marshall, which is very accessible, very readable. Um, but Again, I think that um, not a lot of, she has it, she's not in like our, our cultural consciousness. Like we know who a lot of the writers who lived and, and literary cultural figures who lived at the time she did and who she was very close with. We know them, we know Poe, we know Hawthorne, we know Emerson, we know Thoreau. Um, we should know Margaret Fuller. Um, and uh, so, so the reason I wrote this book was to help in any way I could to bring her name more into our cultural consciousness and to find a different and creative way to do that. So that was my goal. This is a sketch of a young Margaret done by one of her friends. This is the only known photographic image of Margaret done by John Plum in 1846, just before she left for Europe. This is an oil painting by Thomas Hicks. Um, he was an American artist and he painted this in Rome when he was there at the same time as Margaret. He painted it in 1848, pretty much while the Roman Revolution was kicking up. Um, and this hangs in the portrait gallery in Washington City. And this is an engraving by Henry Bryan Hall Jr. This was done after he passed. And there's her signature at the bottom. She was known for her very loopy penmanship. Um, and Margaret often wore a flower in her hair. <laughs> and if anybody has read the Blythdale romance, um, Zenobia, the main character, always wears a flower behind her ear. And for doing that, Margaret was often called exotic. But um, Hawthorne, you know, he uh, definitely modeled Zenobia off Margaret Fuller. Um, one of the things I would love so much to do is I would love to hire a composite artist to take all the images that exist of Margaret and create, paint or sketch an image of her looking at us face on with a smile, with her dancing gray eyes and her chestnut color hair and the flower behind her ear. I mean, it wasn't the custom then in the um, you know, mid 1800s, you didn't really look at the camera or look at the artist. You, you know, it was customary to look away and rarely smiled. <laughs> um, but I would love that because she was known for her charisma, her magnetic um, personality. Um, and uh, I would just, that would be such a treasure to have. Someone could pull that together. But anyhow, if I, if I able to, get someone to do that, I will share it with you. Um, Margaret Fuller Osoli uh, um, died in 1850, and this is her cenotaph. It's located in the Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, slash Watertown. It's a very, very large cemetery. I know some of you have been there, but it was the first of its kind. The cemetery is considered a garden cemetery. Um, kind of happened when they stopped burying people at the churches in the churchyard. Um, and she is not, she and her partner, uh, Giovanni Asoli, are not buried there because their bodies were not recovered. But their little boy, Angelino, 
known as Nino, he is buried there. So that is the PowerPoint. Gives you a little background of Margaret, maybe a little more than you knew. Maybe you knew all of that. So I hope it wasn't too repetitive if you did. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn my camera back on. And if I have to shut it off, I will, but I'm gonna read from the book. Um, the Light Above, a memoir with Margaret Fuller. And I'm going to start with the preface. And again, I know some of you have read the book and some of you have not read the book. For those of you who had, have not read the book, just so you understand how it works, is it basically volleys between me and Margaret. So there, there'll be a Maria passage and a Margaret passage and a Maria and nee, 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 nee. So that's how the book is um, set up. But I'm gonna start with the preface after I have a sip of water. And again, let me know if I'm skipping out to shut my camera. Anybody can chime in, fine. Preface. I was at a loss. I had unburied this person and didn't know what to do with her. What was I gonna do with all of the information in my infatuation with this woman, Margaret Fuller? who was born over 200 years ago. I had read everything written by her, her books, columns, and letters, and almost everything written about her, scholarly biographies, essays, and more. Early one morning while awake in bed, it came to me quite unexpectedly that I was to write from the heart. Something told me I was trying too hard to figure out a how, a what. Instead, I was to go inside and allow what was percolating to work itself from there. Sitting myself down and writing Margaret from the heart became a story about me, too. Why me? Leave me out of this, I thought. But no, it was not to be. I was not allowed to write, about, to write her story without writing my own because I had unburied two women. One would think telling your own story would be straightforward. I was there, it was me. But it's not easy and I was called back day after day to move in closer. Maria's chapters are about me as I remember my life. Margaret's are my interpretation of her and her life. They are not her words, they are not her thoughts. They are my interpretation of her words and thoughts. My interpretation of who she was and is. My interpretation of her feelings and experiences based on what I learned of her. I ingested what I could and I wrote from that well of information. I tried to stay true to my connection with her, to portray my awe and respect, and to not misrepresent her. I wrote Margaret from the inside out. And through this process, I discovered the life guide I had always longed for. And for that, I am a stronger, better person and am eternally grateful. You knowing who Margaret Fuller is after reading this is success. You telling others about this remarkable woman surpasses my mission. And you discovering anything about yourself through reading this memoir, it's it right out of the park. Margaret. My younger siblings, five brothers and a sister, had an entirely different experience than I did. When I was 23, my father moved us to a farm in Groton, Massachusetts. And along with their schooling and my tutoring them, my, these brothers of mine had to get up early in the dark, cold New England mornings to tend to the cows and do other chores. My father, who had traded politics and law for a good dose of farm living, expected them to be his farm hands and believed that this lifestyle would make them not only smart, but we were determined they, were they would attend Harvard 
just like their father, but strong and steadfast. Now and then they would rebel. They did not want to do this kind of work every day. They did not want to get up before sunrise and deal with such drudgery. As they grew, they stopped helping father as much as he needed them. But what could I say? I had rebelled too. I did not like living on the farm. I had rejected our father's decision as well. When we first moved from Boston to this rural town, to this farm, I was angry. I did not want to leave my circle behind. All my connections and access to the bustling that the cities of Boston in Cambridge offered. How could father do this to us? I was the one who outwardly let him know how unhappy I was with the decision. It seemed selfish to me that because he was at a point in his career where he desired a change, he had to drag his entire family to a place that offered less opportunity and society. How did he feel this would benefit us? To make some sort of amends, Father constructed a seat for me on a prime spot of land that he labeled Margaret's Grove. He envisioned I would retreat there to think and read, and in some way that would alleviate the anger I harbored for being ripped from my social and intellectual circles. I hardly acknowledge this structure built solely for me, which, considering there are so many of us, was a thoughtful gesture. I never gave him the satisfaction of seeing me sitting there reading. I always had a desire to be more and to do more. The move to this farm installed yet another barrier to my desires, another obstacle in addition to my being a female and not possessing adequate resources. Yet with a revelation I experienced after Thanksgiving service, when my frustration boiled over, and sent me running from the church in a confused rage, I realized that fighting my lot in this way was not going to serve me well. Instead, doing what I could in genuine service to my family and others would enable me to come home to myself and focus on projects I could accomplish. This restored my faith that one way or another, this would work itself out. Forward movement is often imperceptible when it's ever so slow. But in my mind and heart, I proclaimed my acceptance of the universe and trusted in its care. By dedicating myself more to tutoring my siblings and helping with chores around the home, I became part of the entire mechanism that made things work. I regained my balance and a sense of peace and hope. Then I became sick, and for a few days, it looked bleak. Father sat on my bed and told me in no uncertain terms that he was proud of me, something he had never said before, and that he knew I was good, not perfect, but truly good. When I recovered, I kept his words close. Then he became ill, and within days, he passed. I was devastated. Occasionally I sat with a book in the sanctuary my father had built for me, but I didn't open it. I held it to my chest and let the tears run down my cheeks. I thanked father for although being his subject was difficult, the bottom line was he saw potential in me and he believed in me. I imagined him being in charge was sometimes a lonely and intimidating position as well. I believed he did what he felt was best for his family, providing us with fresher air and a heartier existence on the farm. I wish he had lived long enough to see his sons graduate Harvard, his daughter Ellen, Mary, and me. Oh, how I wish he could have seen me accomplish all that I did. Maria. My greatest fear growing up was that my father would die, that he would have a heart attack or trip down the stairs. We needed him and he seemed the most vulnerable. Dad was a huge presence in the home, even though he wasn't there nearly as much as mom. 
that we had food, lights, heat, clothes and shoes, and whether we made it to doctor and dentist appointments, all hinged on dad, his job, his pay, his diligence. But none of that was on my mind when I worried dad would die. I could not stand the thought of living without him. I needed his big love. My grandfather, an immigrant from Italy, saved up money for my dad to go to college. Granted, college wasn't as expensive back then, but my grandfather was a janitor and had a family to support. He saved up the money for his only surviving son to attend college. Instead of college, dad used the money for a down payment on a house, married, and had six children. He worked a full-time job and other part-time jobs on the side to make ends meet. Although he never said he regretted his decision, his insistence that we all go to college told me he wished he had. Mom ran a tight ship, making sure we made our beds and did our homework, disciplining us when we misbehaved or fought with each other, and assigning chores so we each pulled our weight around the house. I am in awe of how she managed the day-to-day -day goings on of our busy, crowded household. But dad brought the tenderness. He was the romantic. This was especially evident in his love for musicals. He made us listen to them over and over and watch them whenever they were televised. We didn't mind, we liked them too. He especially liked Camelot, the tragedy of an ideal place, a utopia that couldn't last. We still chuckle about the times we'd find dad sitting in the chair late at night after too many drinks, eyes closed, big clunky headphones on, belting out, Camelot, Camelot, with exaggerated fervor. We tiptoe by trying not to disturb him, mostly because he'd want us to sing with him. And then we'd feel obligated to stay, his grasp on our wrists a little too strong to break away kindly. There was hardly a Thanksgiving growing up when we didn't gather in the living room to watch Oklahoma, enthusiastically singing along, bellies full from the feast that included both American and Italian fare. Oh, what a beautiful morning. Oh, what a beautiful day. Margaret. All eyes were on me after my father passed. At 25, my siblings, who had always looked to me for guidance, cast their eyes upon me with even more gravity. My mother had long since relinquished her critical role in the household. Her participation quelled by the loss of two young children and a domineering husband. My mother looked to me as well. Compounding this because we were women, our meager resources fell into the hands of my father's brother, who found pleasure in making us wheedle for what we needed. Uncle Abraham demanded we justify all requests and then played judge, holding us in a state of worry, wondering if we had convinced him that our request was worthy. This put me in a precarious place and especially limited my endeavors since he was really willing to fund any request that benefited me. I was too outspoken and independent, and this he detested. He punished me the only way he could, by not compensating me. My father would have been terribly angered and saddened by the vindictive nature of his brother's behavior. I was determined that my brothers and sisters would receive the best education we could afford. I fought hard for this and Uncle Abraham made a nearly unbearable situation even more stressful. I was forced to put my long dreamed plans to travel Europe to rest, not only due to finances, but because I could not in good conscience leave my family now. They needed me in the absence of my father and no one could have offered me anything to abandon them. Not only did Europe have to wait, but all of my aspirations had to shift. My immediate aim became supporting our household. 
now an issue of what I could earn, not so much what I longed to do, not what I believed was my purpose. With my options limited as a woman, I fell into teaching. Ralph Waldo Emerson, or Waldo as I came to call him, informed me that Bronson Alcott was looking for a teacher for his temple school in Boston. Elizabeth Peabody, who had held the position, was letting it go. Although it didn't pay a lot, it offered a new experience and some sort of income. Plus, I was drawn to working with Bronson, an on and off Concord inhabitant known for his progressive vision and approach to education. Teaching offered me a platform to share and to mold beyond the tutoring I had previously done. Always a believer that if you have knowledge, share it with others. One way or another, teaching seemed the most direct way to do this. In this way, it held appeal, but I quickly discovered the enormous amount of preparation in tedium left me little time for my own endeavors. To compensate for this, I rose early in the morning to work on my projects and fit in a walk, the fresh air and meditative quality of which I could not do without. This grueling schedule and the fact that I wasn't being paid as promised and the realization that Bronson School was floundering due to controversy convinced me to relinquish the position. What a relief. I could identify the aspects of teaching I valued and found much to feel good about there, but the drudgery and the energy it required weakened both my spirit and health. <clears throat> Maria. Our school year always began with a church service attended by the students, their parents, and the teachers. While kneeling, we watched the teachers walk by on their way to communion. We didn't know who our teacher would be. This was long before the days of finding that out before the school year began. When an apparently new teacher with bleached blonde hair and a striped micro miniskirt passed by our pew, my mother whispered that she hoped none of us would have that woman as our teacher, but I did. Miss Katkin was my fourth grade teacher. What a school year it was. School as I knew it was tossed into the air. I'm not sure if this was a modern approach Miss Katkin employed, one radically different from what the nuns and veteran school teachers use, or if she had no plan in mind at all. Before Miss Katkin, I never knew anything about my teachers' lives, but Miss Katkin shared everything with us. We knew about her boyfriend, Ricky, and her dog, Arrow and that her parents owned a bakery in Portsmouth, two hours from Keene. On Mondays, Miss Katkin would often bring in cupcakes from the bakery, delectable cupcakes with little plastic decorations poking out of them. The routine and rote learning going on in the other classrooms couldn't compare with the thrill and excitement of what was going on in Miss Katkin's classroom. Miss Katkin even went so far as to invite us to her apartment once so we could write on computer punch cards that she was our favorite teacher, so she could be entered in the favorite teacher contest. A handful of us showed up at her place on a rainy Saturday morning. She gave us giant stacks of these cards and we wrote over and over again. Miss Katkin is our favorite teacher. She shuttled us popcorn and soda, and we marveled at her cool pad and petted Arrow when he came around. We were sad she didn't win. Whatever her pedagogy, it wasn't working for me. And when test time came, I fumbled. Soon I received an academic warning, an official form stating that I was not performing well. My parents needed to sign this hard piece of paper and I was to return it on Monday. I'd been delivered to hell. After school that Friday, I changed into my play clothes and folded the warning carefully, tucking it into my back pants pocket. At night, I placed it under my pillow. This went on until Sunday night when I knew I had no choice but to present it to my parents. At that point, the piece of paper looked like it had been around forever, 
creased and crumpled. When they saw it, my parents looked at one another. They spoke seriously to me about paying attention and trying harder. One of them signed the note and I was so relieved I could have skipped away. Instead, I walked sullenly. I didn't get good grades from Miss Katkin, but even then I felt it was more her fault than mine. Whatever her grand plan was, it was falling flat with me. But I learned that year. I learned about the glamour of a life of dating, having a career and living in an apartment. A different existence for a young woman than I had seen in my real life. With the signed warning in my bag, I was ready for Monday, hoping for cupcake. Miss Katkin was my favorite teacher. That concludes our reading. <laughs> so at this point, um, let me see how we're doing for time. Um, we'll take questions and comments, right, Elise? Yep, that's perfectly acceptable. Um, so if you guys want to meet yourselves and ask questions directly, you're more than welcome to do that. If you would rather type it into the chat room, I can relay them to her. I have a question. Sure. Uh, Maria, can you talk a little bit about your process of writing, like how you structured your time and your day? And after you had done all this reading and research, how did it evolve as a process? Wow, that's a great question, Carol. Um, yeah, I had done so much reading um, for a few years. Um, and then I, when I just, when I, and I had been taking notes while I'd been reading and I had, you know, sat myself down many times trying to start something. <laughs> I couldn't really figure out what that should be. But then once I decided that I, once I decided that I needed to write from the heart, I just spent two hours every morning in front of the, I can't say in front of the blank screen because I would kind of reread what I had written the day before but two hours a morning I would sit down and write and and I did so on the computer and I would and the interesting thing is I created no outline I had no idea which situations from my life I would write about and which situations from Margaret would come up I honestly just let whatever boiled to the surface to kind of be what I wrote about but um you know, I found that when I wrote something about Margaret, some kind of a natural thread would appear that would then lead me to write about something from my own life. But I did sit down every morning for two hours um, and I wrote. And the first part of that would be going back and reading what I had written the day before and tweaking it a little bit. I tried not to do too much editing the first time through, not let that critic in too much. But yeah, that was basically my process. And how long overall was that? Like a year or how long did it take you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I would say a year and a half of sitting down every morning and writing. Um, you know, so I believe, boy, you know, time goes a little wild. I know that I finished it not long after your wedding, Annie. I came back and I didn't realize I was so close to being done. And that was the fall of 2019. I came back to Florida and I sat down and wrote for a few days. And, and I know anyone who writes kind of knows when things are done. And I was just like, oh, I'm finished. Wow, this is cool. Yeah. <laughs> so I think honestly about a uh, year and a half. Yeah. And I see you're in New York right now, Carol. Maria, I have a, I have a, oh, go ahead, Pat. <laughs> oh, I'm having video difficulties. I'm sorry, Mona, to interrupt. No camera here. Okay. No, no. Um, I, I'll go real quick. Maria, as you compared your life to Margaret's, were there connections that emerged that didn't appear in your original research? Um, surprises that just kind of bubbled up through the writing process and interesting comparative process too. I just really, I, I love it. I think that it really flows nicely in the book. Oh, thank you, Pat. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of it, um, I didn't know. I never had made the connections in advance. Um, 
And, you know, honestly, I keep thinking of more after the book is done. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, I never really realized that kind of, and I'm calling them ping points, P-I-N-G points, ping points. Um, but, yeah, you know, it was amazing how they um, manifested as I started writing. Um, and, you know, they weren't always, the interesting thing about the threads is Margaret and I are very, very different people and and from anything like um from being from traveling and the way we engaged um with with where we went you know like I think oh well I lived in New York and she lived in New York but our experience was so wildly different oh well you know I traveled Europe and she traveled Europe and of course she was the type of person who threw herself into everything 110 percent and I'm not saying that I didn't engage, but not to that level. So, so it was really interesting. Um, a lot of them I didn't really think a lot about ahead of time. And even after I wrote it, I went back and looked and I thought, wow, that's really interesting. So I have to say it was a very intuitive process. And as I mentioned, when I go back and look at passages, when I try to pick out what I'm going to read, I'm still discovering things that I hadn't really um, fully processed um, throughout this whole journey. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. Sure. I'll All jump right. in. I'll jump in because um, I'm sort of piggybacking off Pat and Carol that the, the flow of um, your life and Margaret's life um, was really fascinating um, to the point that occasionally I'd be reading and I'd go, wait, who's speaking? Is this Maria or is this Margaret? I'd have to go back and look because of those parallels. And I think that really added to um, what feels like a lot of universality, even though your lives were wildly different, as you say, there are connections that we have with each other in such various ways. So I actually have, that was just a comment. <laughs> I have yeah, two thank questions. thank you. It's a great um, one. Thank you. I have two questions, though. Um, one that is related is that as you were writing and knowing what you, you know about her, what, how, how did you choose to not use her own words at all, anywhere or little, you know, specific things that she actually said and wrote? I know that you imagined her and that was an organic process. I'm just curious if you ever thought about putting in her actual words. Right. I did think about that. And, and sometimes I would include a quote, a direct quote of hers. But I decided pretty early on that I didn't want to do that because it changed the tone and the feel. Um, I, I wanted to keep it. Um, I wanted to, I, I wanted to keep it to whatever was coming from my heart and my interpretation of her. I think I wanted to make it, I really wanted it to be, I don't, I'm not saying that Margaret's writing is not accessible, but if you've ever read any of her writing, I don't know if anybody's ever read any of her writing directly, like her own writing. Um, it's really not the easiest to read, but it's very, very good. So anybody who tells you that her writing isn't as good as her, her speaking, um, you know, because um, she got that comment a lot. But I, I just wanted to keep it, um, I wanted, that, that's a really good question, you're stumping me a little bit, but I do know that I consciously, <laughs> at early on in the process, decided I was not going to do that. And I wanted to keep it where I didn't need to cite anything. So I didn't want it to be scholarly. I didn't want it to even be at all scholarly. <laughs> not that I really have a problem with scholarly work. I, I love it. I rely on it. I read it all the time, um, but I really didn't want it to be um, anything that was already out there because there's a lot out there that it is in her words. Most of the biographies heavily quote her. Yes. Yeah. Um, my, my, uh, my other question, Maria, is um, what do you think Margaret would say if she read your book? Um, I, think that, I think that she would appreciate it. And, and it's really not easy for me to say this because, you know, she she was, I mean, my, that, that woman was just incredibly um, 
you know, incredibly remarkable, um, brilliant genius. She really was. And, and we would still stand so to learn so much from her. Um, when I was walking on the beach when the book was done, and the, uh, those of you who read the introduction know about the shells and how I kept finding the shells. So when I was walking the beach when the book was done, um, I asked if she was okay with the finished product. And this is what she gave me. It's perfect. And I'm not saying that my book is perfect. I'm saying the shell is, but literally this rolled up onto my toes. So, so I, you know, it's. I think that she would be okay with it. And I was really worried about what some of the Margaret Fuller scholars would, um, how they would react. And one of them that read it said, you know, why aren't you a part of the Margaret Fuller Society? And I'm going to put it out there on the listserv and. And I had another woman who works at the Long Island Fire uh, Lighthouse, which is right behind me, the hanging right there. Um, she works and she's written a book called um, I think Shipwrecked. And it's a work of um, it's a, a novel, a work of fiction about the shipwreck that Margaret Brown in, and um, and she she loves it, too. And so I feel like I'm getting connected with more of the Margaret Fuller, um, you know, um, people who have who also are, you know, wild about her <laughs> and have done a lot of research and writing on her. So that feels really good. Any other questions? What's next? Yeah, what's next? I have um, a second book already in mind. So I'm starting to work and it is about Margaret. I'm not done there yet. And um, I actually, a third book came to mind the other day. So I have a couple of ideas that I'm working, working with. So, and of course, I'm keeping up with uh, me and Teresa with our Nasty Woman Writers Project. So that, have, that is an ongoing project that we absolutely love and are very devoted to. So, but yeah, I'm going to write a couple more about Margaret Fuller. So stay tuned. <laughs> I just have a comment, Maria. Um, I thought it was brilliant. And I too, when Mona was saying she got confused sometimes as to who, who you were writing about it, that, that happened to me and it, it gave me pause um, in a good way, I think. And, and Pat took my question also as terms of what's next. So I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that you're gonna do more. And we, uh, I just, I bought a Margaret Fuller book with you when you and Pat and I went down to Concord and I had a really hard time getting into it. So I'm, I'm glad you said what you said about her writing, but it makes me now want to go back to it. Um, so thank you. Yes, yeah. yes, that's great. And when you read her writing, I mean, she um, had a very classical education and I mean, she just, she's a very, when she writes, she brings so much into whatever it is she's talking about. You know, she makes so many references. And so you really do have to look things up while you're reading and really to get the full gist of what she's saying. But it's definitely worth the, the work um, to read her. Yeah. And of course, like I say to people, you don't find Hawthorne that easy to read. So many times I'm reading his novels, I feel like I'm in the woods, you know, in the dark woods or something, you know, and, and his description is pretty thick. Um, and of course, you know, Thoreau and Emerson, you know, I mean, you know, you kind of have to really pay attention when you're reading their work, too. So I don't think Margaret was um, unusual um, for um, the kind of writing that she was doing. So thank you, Dave. Hey, hey, Maria, I just wanted to say reading that book, being from Arlington, Mass., which is right next to Cambridge and Boston, it just I, I could just picture it all. It was just it was really it was really fun. And I also wanted to say my first comment to myself after I started reading it is I felt you were sitting right next to me. Your yes. voice is so clear as Maria Dentino. I was uh -huh. like, oh, my God, she's back and she will be <laughs> back. So that's the best news. Um, but thank you yeah. so much. Oh, you're welcome, Chris. Thank you so much. What I'm finding... What I'm finding interesting, of course, when I'm reading it, I'm hearing Maria Dentino as like a, an elementary school person speaking. <laughs> and it's, I don't think I've heard your adult voice ever. So um, yeah, yeah. what a trip. 
Honestly, I haven't thought about those things. And I was in Miss Katkin's class too. Were you, Carol? Were you in Miss Katkin's class? No, I was across the hall in Sister Anne's class. You were I, probably jealous of us. I was very <laughs> jealous. And I remember Miss I remember Miss Katkin um, like uh, shaking up the school because she wanted women to wear pants, to be allowed to wear pants. And that was a, such a radical thing. And the nuns went bananas over that. But I remember yeah. that being a big, 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 big controversy. Oh my goodness, that's so funny. Yeah, pantsuits, Teresa. <laughs> yes, pantsuits, imagine that. And a yellow, she painted the walls yellow and painted Snoopies on them. Do you remember yes, that? Yes, we did. You're a good, you're a good man, Charlie Brown, for our, our play. I was Frida. <laughs> okay. Oh, such great memories, right? I haven't thought of those things in so many years. It was, it was really so interesting because, um, the woman from Arlington and you could you could visualize the places she was talking about. I mean, that's how I felt, you know, when you described the, well, your street, um, walking yeah. down Gilbo Avenue. I mean, I just right. could, I could really visualize all of that. And, and I've not had anyone, you know, I haven't read any book that has evoked that kind of memory of childhood. So thank you. It was, it was, oh. I spent a very pleasant uh, af winter afternoon or two with you and Margaret, so thank you for that. Oh, good. Oh, thank you, Allison. It is so great to, um, it's so exciting to, again, the ping points in the book, but the ping points when I get it out there, the people who remember, who have connections with the different phases of, of um, what I write about my life and where I was. So it, it's really an incredible, it's a great thing about a memoir, I think, right? Any other questions? I know we're a little over. Be good? It looks Thank like we you might all. Be good. Yeah. Um, just a little thing. I did post the link to the book in the chat room. So if you guys, if there's anybody who doesn't have it, then you go right to your indie bookstore and get it from there and we'll send it out. Um, but yeah. That was a very lovely presentation. Thank you very much for joining us and holding this with us today. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you everyone who tuned in. I couldn't be happier looking out right now and seeing all of you. So thank you all, Kathy, Irene, Guy, Judy. Oh boy, now I feel like I need to <laughs> recognize you all. But I love you all. Thank you for being here today. It means a lot. It was thank wonderful. You, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And hi, everybody. Bye. I see some of you. <laughs> nice to see you. Bye, Maria. Bye. 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 Thanks so much. Bye-bye.